So you might ask, well, why does bad risk modeling persist? Now, this it took me an embarrassingly long time to understand this, about a decade. And the reason is very simple. Bad risk modeling persists because the banks want bad risk models because they understate their risks. And the regulatory system's captured by the banks, so it reflects what the banks want. So that's why it persists. So risk modeling is just a game. It's not risk modeling at all. What you're trying to do is you pretend to model risks, but what you're really doing is gaming the risk numbers. You get them as low as possible. And this game even has a name. It's called risk weight optimization. Get them as low as possible. The lower the risk weights, the lower your capital requirement, and the, the more capital can be siphoned off in bonuses and things like that. So the whole banking system becomes denuded of its capital. So the bottom line is capital regulation is used to decapitalize the banks. That's not how it's supposed to be, but that's how it is. And then when the bank goes bust, you just get a bailout and the game starts all over again. So you have all these problems and more with regulatory stress testing. Now let me make a couple of general points and then look to some specific examples. One general problem is that regulatory stress testing implies a risk management standard, an approved way to manage your risks. Now I would assert to you that this is inherently uh, self-contradictory. So remember, when VAR numbers go up, the banks are, are going to be pressured to sell in order to get their VAR numbers down. The problem is that what works at the level of an individual bank cannot work at the level of the system. So one bank can, say, can sell, but the lot cannot. The assets have to be held by somebody. So if everybody does the same thing, everybody sells in a crisis, then pri cr prices crash and the crisis amplifies. So the thing is totally counterproductive. And that is inherent to any, any risk management standard. That's the first point. Second point is even simpler. It, uh, it's another contradiction. Central bank stress tests lack credibility because central banks have to push the message that the system is safe. I mean, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So even if they think otherwise, they cannot possibly admit it. Because in that case, people would say, well, you haven't been doing your job, et cetera, et cetera, and it gets very uncomfortable. And of course, the banking system might collapse. So the stress test then becomes a PR exercise. I can't overstate how important this is. This is like a Soviet election, in which you have a fair election, the Communist Party always wins. You can only ever get one result from the stress test. So therefore, it's just a PR exercise, and you may as well dismiss it as such. And if you look at the history of these stress tests, and I'll go through them, they all give us the same message. It's always safe until it collapses, and then we don't know what happened. So I could go on and talk about various criteria for stress testing. I'll just put those up for a few seconds. And this is what the stress testing literature suggests you should do, if you have to do it. It's a whole bunch of sensible stuff. Suffice it to, to, to say that regulatory stress tests fail all of these criteria, all of them. So number one, consider, do not use risk-weighted assets, right? For the simple reason, go back to that chart that I had. They don't, they don't, not that they don't work, they're worse than useless. The lower the risk weight, the higher the real risk, but you can't see it. So they all use risk-weighted assets. Number two, there should be multiple scenarios. So what do they do? They use one scenario or one key scenario that dominates. So l consider this. Let's suppose that you're covered under one scenario and you, you at attend to it with loving care, like the, the Federal Reserve does. Vast amount of resources going to modeling this. Okay, how do you know that you're then covered against all the other scenarios you didn't consider? Well, I would assert that to ask that question is to answer it. You don't. So no single scenario can possibly give you confidence that the system is safe. It's just, it's just impossible, and it's obvious. Anyway, let's go through some of these. As they, uh, instead of me going through those criteria, I'd like to look at some real-world examples. And st let's start with the Fannie and Freddie stress test, which are actually really interesting, because they show everything that can go wrong was that wrong in that case. So these go back to the early 90s. There was concern about their solvency. And there were proposals at the time to increase their capital requirements to, to, to make them safer. So Fannie then managed an audacious coup. It commissioned Paul Folker to examine the matter, and Folker concluded that Fannie was safe. That's great. 
That gave the, the management the opportunity to fight off people who were meddlers from Congress. Fanny's chief executive could then claim that their business was safer than banking. Here's a nice quote. He said, there are no unpleasant, side of, no unpleasant surprises because of the nature of our business. We don't have any see-through buildings, any third world countries, or any strip shopping malls. We just have those mortgages. So that gave them the green light. It then took nearly a decade for the rocket scientists to come up with model-based capital requirements that were wafer thin, a little north of zero. And this at the time when the GSEs were loading up at, on, on subprime, which was then known as affordable housing. Okay, so it didn't look so bad at the time. This wasn't a problem, because the models said all the toxic stuff was safe. So there we are. As the details were being finished, Fanny then scored another coup by commissioning a distinguished team of economists led by Joseph Stiglitz to carry out their own investigation. And the Stiglitz team concluded that even under a decade-long nuclear winter-type scenario, a very, very severe scenario over a decade, the probability of failure was basically zero, nothing to worry about. So the GSEs then went on a massive binge and effectively failed six years later after you know, just half of a not very nuclear winter. So the question is, what went wrong? Well, part of the problem is the obvious one, that the stress-based capital requirements were actually very, very, very low. That is a kind of hint. Of course, you may ask why they were low. We'll get to that. But part of the problem was that the GSEs, uh, the system allowed the GSEs to game the system by loading up on risks that the models didn't capture. This is all kind of, you know, kindergarten stuff. But that's exactly what happened. It was almost as if this was a design feature of the system. Now, add to that a couple of other points. The GSEs' management were working to contracts that encouraged excess risk-taking. So they were encouraged to game the system that was meant to control them. And then, on top of that, the management were gaming the GSE's government-sponsored status. So the joke was this. They'd tell Congress not to worry because the government wasn't on the hook. Then they'd turn around and tell Wall Street not to worry because the government was on the hook. And then, of course, you had all the government meddling. And then we, we wonder why it all went wrong. You see, but it's all there. So let me turn to the Fed stress test. Now, these were introduced in, in 2009, and the initial one, the Supervisory Capital Assessment Program, was a fairly light exercise. This was followed by the Comprehensive Capital Assessment and Review in 2011, which has since become an annual event. Now, I've got to emphasize, the CCAR is a highly aggressive, invasive program in which banks are required to prove the adequacy of their models to the Fed's models. Each CCAR has been more extensive and demanding than the previous one. And then on top of that, in 2013, you had all the Dodd-Frank stuff came in, the DFA tests. And in 2014, there were new requirements under Basel III, and all of these are somewhat different from each other, and they've got to do them all, and the pro process is still expanding. Now, critics pointed out that the tests were reliant on the Fed scenarios, and these were not scenar uh, particularly stressful. The key scenario is an extremely adverse scenario. The others don't really matter, so effectively it's only one scenario, and it's fairly mild. They were also blind to risks identified by outside observers. Let me give you an example. The risks of a Eurozone collapse were ignored till the 2012 CCAR. Well, m you may have noticed that the Eurozone nearly collapsed the year before. That's probably why the Fed woke up to the problem, but it put it in after the event. And the CCAR still ignores the biggest risk of all, which is the risk created by enormous off-balance sheet activities, and nobody really knows how big these are. You might remember we had some of this before in 2008. Now, when I was researching Math Gone Mad, I interviewed the senior managers of a major US bank. And what they told me was this, that, that much of its normal business activity had to stop because of the need to feed the models demanded by the Fed. 98% of management time at that time was on regulatory stuff, 98%. Both its IT systems and its management were completely overwhelmed. The bank was forced to make huge investments in models and modelers it didn't want and didn't need 
to satisfy the Fed. It had to call a halt to further acquisitions because it couldn't assess the regulatory risks in its potential acquisitions. And the models warped its whole business model right down to the level of individual loans. And this was a conservatively well-run bank. It had no problems. It had done very well through the crisis because it was conservative. But the models couldn't be challenged. So we're betting everything on these models and hoping that the models are right, but they're not. So the models couldn't be challenged, but the banks have no incentive, sorry, no choice, but to manage to what they perceive the Fed's model to be. And the Fed won't tell them. So they don't do that. They fail the test. So the bottom line is that they end up with much the same crappy models. They then make much the same mistakes, and the result is much greater systemic risk. And here's the nice point. None of the models pick up this systemic risk. Okay. And then furthermore, over time, the tests become routine, as they inevitably must do, and the results become predictable. The whole exercise then becomes a meaningless exercise in compliance, a ritual. It serves no purpose other than to make us all blind to what's really going on. There's now a flourishing consultancy industry that specializes in how to pass the tests. The guys who run this industry are experts. These are former Federal Reserve officials who used to conduct the tests themselves. They leave the Fed and get 10 times more in the private sector. So the bottom line is the very process of repeated stress testing makes the, stress, the, the tests themselves futile. 